My Globe News brings global views. I would like to welcome our listeners to another edition of iGlobe News Pods. The topic of our interview today is Global Nuclear Fuel Cycle Approach for the Sustainable World. I'll be discussing this topic with Professor Huang il Sun, Chair of the Department of Nuclear Energy at Ulsan National Institute of Science and Engineering, otherwise known as UNIST, in the Republic of Korea. You are an internationally renowned expert in your field, and you have received numerous awards. At UNIST, you lead a Korean national R&D program on non-refueling microreactors in support of the global net zero goal. Before joining UNIST, you were a professor of nuclear energy at Seoul National University and at MIT. At SNU, your research focused on nuclear materials aging and nuclear waste transmutation, as well as nuclear security and nuclear material development for fission and fission systems. Gen 4 lead fast reactors and nuclear fuel cycle technology. You have advised your government on nuclear energy related matters and have worked closely with the IAEA and OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. You received your bachelor's in nuclear engineering from Seoul National University and a master's in mechanical engineering from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, otherwise known as KAIST. You got your PhD in nuclear materials engineering from MIT. You have published widely over 300 technical articles, including over 100 SCI listed papers and have co-authored seven books and over 30 patents go to your name. In addition to being a professor at UNIST, you are president of the International Forum of Reactor Aging Management director of the Nuclear Security Research Institute of the Korea Nuclear Policy Society, and of course, Professor Emeritus of Seoul National University in the Republic of Korea, and a fellow Emeritus of the National Academy of Engineering of Korea. Welcome, Professor Wang, to our show. Thank you very much, Ms. Markov, for this exciting subject. Yes, it really is a very, very timely subject. Now, let me start by asking you, nuclear energy is a non-CO2 producing energy source, which counters the global warming trend. Why is nuclear power climate friendly? Because it just does not produce uh, global warming gases like carbon dioxide or methane. Uh, unlike a uh, fossil energy counterpart, uh, it's very much like renewable energy in the sense that the nuclear energy also uh, is uh, sustainable in the sense the fuel for nuclear energy, including uranium and hydrogen is almost limitless. So uh, considering that the lifetime of Earth and mankind is under of a order of 100 million years. This nuclear fission or nuclear fusion alone or combined can support the entire lifespan of a human being as well as Earth. So that means moving forward, there's almost no alternative to some form of, of nuclear energy. But there are many who oppose nuclear energy. And of course, they have in their mind Fukushima and Chernobyl and all these horrible accidents that have happened there. So what do you say to those who doubt that nuclear power is safe and cost efficient? Very important question. It's a very hard question as well. Uh, let's think about renewable energy, including uh, solar power and geothermal energy as well as wind and uh, uh, hydro power. Uh, solar power is coming from sun, nuclear fusion reactions. So it involves uh, intense radiation as well. So there are 300,000 uh, people per year contracting skin cancer from uh, ultraviolet radiations. So nothing is uh, uh, perfectly clean. And hydropower and wind power is derived from solar power as uh, this will heat up 
one area and cool down the other side. So wind is driven from hot area to cold area. And the water evaporates in from hot area, then precipitates in cold area, normally at the high elevation, and then moving down to generate hydropower. So let's think about geothermal energy, which is basically the energy coming from radioactive decay of uh, radionuclides that were formed during the initial phase of Earth's uh, which is uh, almost the same time of a solar system formation. When there were a lot of a nuclear reactions, including fission and fusion, sun and surrounding uh, planets get a lot of radioactivity. And short half-life materials are all decayed out. However, the nuclides, including uranium, thorium, and potassium, still remains as their half-life is as long as a uh, million years. So uh, most of the energy that we have from Earth's core is the decay heat, alpha, beta decay heat, from those long-living radionuclides. That's why we get the radons from Earth, and that's a cause of 10 to 20% of uh, lung cancer of entire world. So renewable energy is nothing but natural form of nuclear energy. We all get the energy by mc square, uh, the famous formula by Dr. Einstein. So there are fortunate countries like Nor Norway, maybe uh, uh, some other country like Iceland, where a lot of uh, hydro energy or geothermal energy are available to provide uh, full need of uh, this uh, electricity and maybe other energy requirements. So uh, we call that RE100, which means 100% supply of all energy demand by renewable energy. That's perfect. But there are most of the country having higher population density. As we increase the population density, we get smaller and smaller available land for collecting those renewable energies. That's why we need a farmed nuclear energy. That is a nuclear power plant. In the early history, the nuclear engineers and scientists were all too much optimistic. We were talking about uh, nuclear energy, which is uh, too cheap to mirror. However, the human experience well, is uh, very, very unpredictable. So we now realize after 70 years of uh, our uh, practice, nuclear energy is a very difficult uh, technology to master. So there were many accidents. Now we learned uh, how to make this uh, farmed nuclear energy uh, having the same safety and environmental uh, satisfaction levels as uh, the natural counterpart, that is renewable energies. So we call this one as do no significant harm as uh, European Union uh, put. Uh, to classify green taxonomy. Either it's uh, natural or farmed, they should be as clean and as safe as solar or wind or geothermal energy. Now, we have technology, so-called small modular reactor, and also generation four technology. If we invest more money and invest uh, more technology in there uh, beyond the, what we have today, we can guarantee this farmed nuclear energy or small modular or combined generation four small modular reactors can be actually better than renewable energy counterparts. So we are hopeful. We have a lot of work to do and we'll be 
very, very happy to see people uh, agreeing to us. Well, thank you for this, this wonderful insight. I have a, a couple of follow-up questions before we continue. So I think it's very interesting how you classify nuclear energy with the other renewables, um, because of course, in the mainstream media discourse out there, nuclear energy is always not considered or often not considered the renewable energy, but like the dangerous energy. But you make a very strong argument um, for classifying it exactly in, in the same grouping as, as you said, solar, which also is renewable energy or wind, for instance. And of course, in Europe, um, having it classified as green energy helps to finance um, these, these nuclear power um, plants, um, which of course will be necessary, as you already mentioned, um, to provide enough power for, for humankind moving forward. So I have two follow-up questions. Um, how does one finance these very cost-intensive um, reactors? Um, are they becoming cheaper? And what do you do with the nuclear waste, which is, of course, also on everybody's minds? Right. I would call uh, the requirement or mandate for farmed uh, nuclear energy uh, by five requirements. One, P is proliferation resistance. E is environmental friendliness, including the impact of spent nuclear fuel or high-level waste. And A is accident tolerance. And the C is climate protection capability. And finally, E is economy. So by collecting all those uh, uh, initials, you can find this one as P's, P-E-A-C-E. -E. So let's remember this five mandates for farm the nuclear energy to become uh, com compatible with our uh, standard that we have for renewable energies. So you asked about economy, which is the last E in this uh, five mandate. Economy of nuclear energy is already outstanding in countries like uh, uh, Asia, Korea, and Japan, because we import most of uh, uh, other uh, fossil energy from abroad, and the cost of shipping and handling is very high. So nuclear power generates electricity uh, on a cost basis is about uh, 5 cents per kilowatt hour. In Korea, compared with uh, solar power, which is about 20 cents per kilowatt hours, and about 12 cents per kilowatt hour for wind energies. And hydropower is a lot more expensive than any of those because we don't have much water and we have to control flooding and drought by using dams. So those are not for electricity. So we generate a tiny piece of available energy for electricity. As a consequence, overall operation and maintenance cost is um, very high per kilowatt hour basis. But in the countries uh, with a low population density like United States, the solar power is very, very inexpensive. So in uh, Western European countries, uh, and especially in Northern part where wind power is very uh, stable and strong, and their cost is very low compared to nuclear power. However, those renewable energies are not without penalties because they are variable energies. We have to provide some uh, storage capability to supply energy demand when those renewable energy are not available or less available. So uh, we think about uh, energy storage systems, or in Europe, fortunately, uh, international grid systems. But country like uh, South Korea is uh, uh, literally electrically an island because North Korea is blocking all transmission lines 
and southern part is uh, surrounded by uh, ocean. Japan is a uh, truly an island, and Taiwan as well. So uh, in this case, renewable energy has very high cost, as I mentioned before. So uh, nuclear power already has satisfied the economical criteria for many countries, I would say, having a population density of about 300 people per square kilometer or above. Korea, Taiwan is about 500 people per kilowatt, kilo, uh, square kilometers. And Japan is about 350 uh, people per square kilometers. And uh, Belgium and Netherlands, are those are all in that category. In European Union, in general, has a relatively low population density. On the average, it's 118 people per square kilometer. So that's why EU has announced they will supply about 60% uh, 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 to 80% of their electricity demand by renewable energy by 2050. That is great. But we have to uh, work with other part of the world as uh, non-OECD member states produce two thirds of carbon dioxide of the world today. So uh, many countries, especially in non-OECD circle has high population density or they have very poor uh, renewable energy sources. In that case, we'll see nuclear energy as it is today is more economically competitive than renewable counterpart already. And issue is uh, a, uh, uh, how uh, we can uh, make an ideal mix of uh, renewable energy and nuclear energy. Already, International Energy Agency, IEA, based in Paris, France, has recommended a good mathematical tool called marginal abatement cost curve, which shows how much cost would it take to abate one metric ton of carbon dioxide for individual uh, technical methodologies. So we find in that curve, nuclear energy is already very, very uh, profitable option whereas renewable energy is uh, the other side. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Why is it important to set up a global and multilateral cooperation to set up a multinational nuclear fuel cycle centers, which could be an important energy dimension of multilateral security cooperation? And how far away are we from achieving this goal? So now uh, let's take a step back and look at the uh, uh, time frame over 2050 uh, when we have to neutralize uh, carbon dioxide. Then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the non-OECD member states had a huge homework, including China and India and other countries, and to sequestrate their existing carbon dioxide by replacing them with nuclear energy. However, uh, the whole world is still on the, uh, another race of Cold War. Many countries have ambitions to produce nuclear bomb. Now, Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine uh, this crisis, which is un, uh, unfolding right now, is now instigating many countries about uh, their future nuclear ambitions. So this is a serious problem. We have, uh, 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 we have to satisfy global uh, climate uh, uh, mandate, same time peace mandate. So uh, what do we do to uh, supply inexpensive, safe, and clean uh, farm the nuclear energy, same time without uh, exerting a uh, threat 
to the uh, whole world about the, the nuclear war. I think uh, enrichment, enrichment means uh, the separating special isotope of uranium, which is uranium-235 isotope from uh, natural uranium. Um, and the increasing uranium-235 concentration from original 0.7% uh, to uh, somewhere up to 20% so that we can make a nuclear uh, uh, undergo chain reaction in a stable manner for a long time in economical fashion. So that's called the enrichment process normally done by a centrifuge machine. Uh, and the other side, the spent nuclear fuels are produced as a consequence that contains up to 1% by weight dangerous plutonium in there. So uh, nuclear power plant uh, generating 1,000 megawatt electric uh, power produce 20 metric tons of spent nuclear fuels each year. So 1% is uh, as much as 200 kilogram of plutonium each year. So we, we can make a nuclear bomb out of 10 kilogram of plutonium. So uh, out of one nuclear power plant, we can make 20 bombs each year. This is a horrendous problem. If this uh, um, uh, risk is all unco uncontrolled and going to get out of hand, because many countries are unhappy with the today's uh, superpowers uh, um, uh, failure to meet MPT uh, intention. And although they are, those uh, many countries are still required by superpowers to obey MPT uh, promise. So uh, when this situation continues, We'll be getting into, uh, uh, we'll be jumping, maybe we sequestrate carbon dioxide. So, jumping out of a uh, pan, maybe into fire. So, what should we do? Reprocessing is the chemical process, uh, taking spent nuclear fuel and dissolving them into a chemical fluid, including nitric acid in case of aqueous process or liquid molten salt in pyrochemical process. So when they are dissolved, so their liquid color from uh, changes from clear to black. This is black color when we condition electrochemically, they separate plutonium out of this. So reprocessing is basically producing a plutonium dangerous material out of the waste. So if this is done in accordance with the uh, IAEA protocol, it's fine. You can eliminate uh, dangerous long-living uh, radioactive isotope. Also, it can uh, prevent a diversion of spent nuclear fuel into a nuclear bomb uh, in the long run. Uh, that can happen when spent fuel is uh, directly disposed of uh, underground, uh, which is uh, considered uh, safe today. And then after about 300 years, all short-living uh, radio radio radioactivity will be uh, disappeared. And plutonium will be remaining for 100,000 years. And somebody get in there without getting exposed to radiation because all short-living radiations are gone. They can uh, grab it and take it out, out of underground after 300 years. Maybe countries several hundred years later are in a disarray state and there is no security and no protection 
against uh, uh, intrusion, no protection against the diversion, then nuclear bomb will become something like a drug today. It will be nightmare to whole mankind. <clears throat> so I'm strongly uh, supporting uh, recycling, eliminating and burning all those dangerous materials instead of leaving them underground into a potentially uncontrolled uh, state. But this uh, enrichment and reprocessing can lead to uh, uh, nuclear bomb productions if it's not adequately safeguarded. So, uh, the multinational fuel cycle was uh, proposed by world leading uh, uh, thinkers, including uh, former Director General of IAEA, El Baradai, in year 2003, and also uh, President Putin of Russia as early as 2001, and the President uh, Bush second in 2005, they all uh, agreed we have to uh, have a multinational control of both enrichment and the reprocessing. So by having a multinational operation, maybe uh, one or two locations per continent, big enough to provide enough enriched uranium and recycle the fuel to all of the world, then we have no uh, concern about misuse of these uh, materials. But question, there are two questions. First, the, the multinational control will eliminate unalienable rights, sovereign rights of individual countries, which was guaranteed by Article 4 of MPT, uh, from using their own enrichment and reprocessing facilities. Second, if they enrich and reproduce, reprocess at uh, a certain concentrated park, then it's uh, a lot of effort to supply by transportation to all of the world. There is also risk of uh, accident during the transportations. Also, uh, theft and uh, robbery, all kind of things. So uh, how do we handle that? That was a big question. That's why we don't have that yet. So, but uh, one good solution uh, to implement those ideas is that we make a uh, voluntary a consortium first. For example, in Asia, we definitely need farmed nuclear energy, including countries, uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Philippines, and maybe other Southeast Asian countries. So we will set up a voluntary multinational work. It is uh, not uh, impinging, un, uh, eliminating unalienable sovereign rights because we chose to do so. Then set up uh, enrichment and reprocessing plant. Then transportation issue is still remaining. Then uh, we have been developing a micro reactor, which is small enough to go inside uh, shield the cask. That cask is uh, uh, already uh, designed, built, and tested, and uh, used uh, many places, and transported many places, and was put into the wild fire, put into a impact, uh, put into a uh, sinking into the water, all kind of accident was uh, uh, mm. happened, but it is uh, without consequence of any danger. So uh, this micro reactor will go inside so-called Type C uh, shielded shipping cask, which is uh, 
radiation proof and the shock proof and bulletproof. So in that case, that micro reactor is uh, uh, fueled with either fresh and enriched uranium or radioactive recycled plutonium fuels in there. And our design is uh, made such that one fueling in the beginning would allow continuous operation without refueling over up to 40 to 50 years. So over entire lifetime of a nuclear reactor. So then we deploy those reactors wherever it's needed. Then after their use, that fuel will be taken back because no refueling is necessary. The reactor lead will be weld shut. Nobody can uh, break open this one. This way, uh, we can uh, assure the physical security. And then in addition, uh, arrangement-wise, we don't sell any fuel. We only lease those fuels to uh, countries need the nuclear electricity. Then they cannot touch because the title of this uranium or this recycled fuel belongs to multinational center. If they touch this one, they are breaking the law and the uh, United Nations can take actions. So this way we can provide them enough energy without uh, carbon dioxide, any other greenhouse gas, and without any uh, uh, risk of uh, nuclear diversion or producing uh, nuclear bomb. So what about the cost? Because we don't replace uh, fuel, uh, this is uh, uh, also cooled by heavy liquid metal, unlike uh, today's nuclear power plant where we use water as a coolant. Heavy liquid metal, uh, including lead or lead bismuth alloy, has a huge advantage in the sense it has a high boiling point, about 1,700 degrees centigrade. Uh, let's remember the all structural materials, including reactor vessel and fuels, melt at the 1,400 degrees centigrade. So it'll never boil uh, to produce any void until a worst accident takes place. We have designed the reactor just small enough, so no boiling or no melting will take place. And we have designed the reactor small enough, even on the worst accident or even on the worst impact that can be imaginable on the transportation and imaginable on the, a ship operation, which means we prepare a ship by this micro reactor and ship collide each other or hit by iceberg in the Arctic, things like that. That's a huge force compared with earthquake. Nevertheless, this is safe. We, show, we have shown that by analysis. So uh, this extremely safe and also extremely uh, uh, lasting and also proliferation resistant and spent nuclear fuel is no problem because it belongs to multinational center where it's recycled. And uh, entailing waste is no longer high-level waste. We developed a technology called pyrogreen, which means we improved decontamination factor high enough the final waste will be intermediate-level waste, just like a waste coming from hospitals and or industrial practice. And having a time span of institutional control only about 300 years or less. After that, we can dig up without any threat to a human or a biological sphere. So in this case, we know all those uh, radioactive uh, 
product from hospitals or industry with the class of uh, in the middle level or low level ways have been safely handled uh, worldwide. So uh, nuclear power is the same as those class of operations. So this can be uh, buried uh, underground, maybe at uh, several hundred meter depths, maybe at uh, several kilometer depths. Now, new technology called deep isolation is evolving from United States, uh, derived from a uh, shale gas technology. You might have heard about fracking, the deep uh, drilling vertically down to about several kilometers deep, then turn right angle and drill horizontal ways. So this technology become uh, practiced. And now in the United States alone, there are more than 10,000 holes. Uh, and uh, they provide a shocking force to shatter uh, rocks. But in case of deep isolation, we don't even have to shock to shatter the rocks because we don't want to break the rocks. Gently drill, just to turn right angles and make horizontal drills. And then all final waste from pyro green will go gently in there. So we have a lot of space, enough space to make a nuclear power sustainable for 100 million years forever this way, because they will disappear after 300 years. Then we can put more and more. And this drilling process become so advanced, we don't generate earthquake anymore by this drilling process. So it can be very much uh, uh, society friendly. Then uh, economical wise, EU uh, has already analyzed and they showed the cost of electricity today will go up by 20%. If we choose to make reprocessing and recycle and burn them inside the fast reactor, such as heavy liquid metal cooled micro reactors. So 20% up. Well, when you think about the time frame of 2050, how much do you want to pay for your electricity bill? Unfortunately, we will have to pay a lot more than today. When you think about hydrogen, green hydrogen is about three times more costly than regular hydrogen today. And green ammonia is three times more costly than regular ammonia today. So whatever that will eliminate uh, warming gas will cost more. So 20% added cost and a lot more safety uh, provisions at added cost will be uh, comfortably acceptable by the world. It is a, a very, very big topic. As you just mentioned, energy costs are, are skyrocketing. And um, of course, the war in Ukraine is, is driving um, this rising energy cost for everybody. Um, the, you've mentioned this really compact, thought-through um, system of your micro-reactors. Uh, will this topic come up at the next review conference of the NPT in August 2022? And what do you think will be the main issues discussed there? Because obviously the world has to find a solution to the ener energy crisis we find ourselves in. That's a very uh, important question. In fact, uh, Dr. Francis Markov uh, constantly urged me to bring this topic to uh, MPT review conference. I tried to do so, but by this COVID crisis, they have been postponing conference and uh, many times. So I, uh, uh, I failed to keep track of this event and I won't be able to present this time. But uh, we are getting uh, increasing confidence about the concept. And we are getting increasing number of people supporting this idea, not uh, just the idealistic people and practical people. 
And uh, even those uh, who opposed to uh, reprocessing in the past, now turning their mind to support reprocessing today. And already multinational enrichment uh, process is now working today. For example, Uratom and uh, uh, also uh, mm, the South, uh, South America and Brazil and Argentina are now employing multinational enrichment arrangement. So uh, why don't we extend that concept to reprocess sectors? And uh, recently, I observed United States, especially democratic government, that used to object uh, reprocessing from the time of uh, President Carter after nuclear explosion of India in 1974 uh, is now turning around. And Canada, which has been uh, assuming direct exposure of can do spent nuclear fuel, now is turning around. So they are developing this kind of fast reactors. Uh, ranging from liquid metal cooled to uh, molten salt cooled fast reactors. The commonality is to uh, burn those uh, dangerous plutonium and generate electricity out of this. And then we can uh, end up with uh, intermediate and low level waste. And if United States and Canada work together and lead this uh, effort, and set up a bilateral a recycling center. Uh, I'll be very pleased to push my government to join into uh, that arrangement. I'm sure I can push Japan to jump into that. I'm sure Taiwan will join. I think uh, we may make a huge impact on both uh, sustainability of energy and the climate as well as uh, the peace. Thank you for that answer. Um, do you expect spent nuclear fuel recycling and the introduction of fast neutron reactors to become the new norm in the quest for decarbonization? Yes, uh, this is a complicated matter, especially for those who uh, just uh, uh, grossly object to nuclear power whatsoever. Uh, when we look at the uh, uh, plan for nuclear energy development of uh, major nuclear power states, including United States and Russia and European Union, uh, what you said is exactly what's happening. So, uh, IAEA has been publishing so-called SMR book. They publish every two years. And when I look at their first uh, version app that was produced in 2010, uh, there were about 60 reactor designs around the world. And uh, more than 60% of that design were water-cooled reactors. And the 40% was uh, fast reactors. But now, after 10 years, the latest uh, uh, issue uh, in 2020 showed 72 designs. About 60% is now fast reactors. Now 40% is water-cooled reactors. And then that trend is also shown in long-term nuclear power uh, technology projection by United States and Russia. Um, as well summarized by OECD and EA. And uh, they continuously increase Gen 4 reactors with the time up to 2100. And the water reactor will gradually diminish with the time. There are two reasons. One is uh, fuel sustainability. You know, water cooled reactor use only uranium 235 which is uh, as small as 0.7% in the nature, even though we enrich them to 5% or up to 20%, the best majority of uranium, which is called depleted ozone, is become a waste 
because they don't have much when 235. If this way uh, we can deplete um, a terrestrial resource of uranium very quickly. But fast reactor can burn uranium-238 as well. That's why we can burn as long as 40 years by one-time initial fueling. We only need an enrichment up to 20% to make uh, such a long burning cycles. So also, by comparing 0.7% of uranium-235 in natural uranium ore, now we can consume up to 100%. So by simple uh, uh, arithmetics, it's about 150 times more energy utilization from the uranium. So actually 140 40 times. If we uh, use 140 times more efficiently, then we can utilize nuclear power truly to fight against climate change. Uh, and then in our calculation, if we use nuclear power a lot, maybe after thousands of years, uranium on the terrestrial uh, <clears throat> environment, uh, may, uh, may be depleted. Then in case, there are huge amount of uranium in seawater. We can extract uranium from seawater, then maybe seawater concentration will go down. When that happens, there are a lot of sand underwater containing uranium. Those sand will dissolve uranium into the seawater to maintain the same concentration. This is why I told in the beginning, nuclear energy, both fission and fusion, are renewable as much as renewable energy today. Thank you for that very interesting answer. I'd like to move to our last block of questions, which revolves around the whole idea of the nuclear weapons free zone um, and also your SHAPE initiative. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, or KSA, recently invited nuclear power vendors to technical information disposition processes, but excluded the US and France. In this connection, it should be taken into account that the global effort to achieve adherence to the IAEA additional protocol for enhancing international nuclear safeguards is not accepted by KSA. Creating regional nuclear fuel cycle centers may contribute to achieving a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East and on the Korean Peninsula. What are your thoughts on this? Right, now uh, nuclear power is now received again uh, as a solution for global warming. So uh, many countries are expanding uh, their nuclear programs, but now politics is entering into this uh, deployment, especially in the uh, Middle East. Iran, with the JCPOA, has uh, a right to enrich and reprocess. Then uh, Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, think it's unfair uh, to restrict uh, their unalienable rights uh, different from Iran. So this is a problem. If Iran uh, triggers a crisis like this, and then Saudi Arabia follows, then whole uh, the neighboring uh, state may follow. This is a crisis. Today's technology cannot uh, provide uh, a solution to this kind of situations. So what can you do? As I mentioned, if we provide a multinational concept with uh, micro reactors, uh, without uh, transporting tidal fuel to those states. And those states who uh, agree to this idea can enjoy uh, joining this multi-national multi, uh, fuel cycle. Same time, they may support nuclear weapon free zone same time. Then the advantage is uh, enjoying uh, safe, clean, sustainable, and peaceful, and also 
uh, economic uh, uh, energy to fight climate change and then protect their industry from carbon tax. And then also um, providing security, uh, national security uh, against uh, any nuclear threat uh, by other countries. Then this is a huge advantage. And if we, uh, we can uh, succeed uh, first uh, group to start, uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> campaign, then uh, we can overcome uh, today's uh, dilemma, uh, both in export control and also additional protocols, all kind of problems that we have left as a loophole of MPT uh, uh, arrangement. So uh, um, I've been working with uh, many people, including Dr. Francis Markov to uh, assemble a uh, new organization called the Summit of Honor on Atoms for Peace and Environment, which dubs as shape. And that has been in launched in 2010 in Seoul and then 2012 in Brussels. And we were trying to have a third one in the United States, but Korean government went into denuclearization and failed to support this one. But now, last uh, um, month, we got a uh, good government back in South Korea. And now nuclear power will become a uh, most important energy source in this uh, peninsula to fight against a both uh, climate change and economical uh, risk. So uh, United States has uh, agreed to work very closely as uh, President Biden uh, articulated in a uh, summit last month uh, in, held in Seoul in May 21st. Then if two countries work closer to develop so-called advanced or generation four small modular reactor with advanced fuel cycle, and also agreed to uh, expand their technology to uh, establish more and uh, strength of a non proliferant treaty, then I think ultimate direction uh, can be a uh, uh, multinational fuel cycle. So now the shape uh, can be uh, reinstated uh, with a strong support of the United States and Korean government. When that happens, we'll seriously talk about uh, arrangement. Now, with the, based on the hard evidence of a technology called the micro that that is uh, non-repealing uh, liquid metal called uh, transportable uh, uh, reactor, which can be deployed all over the world. So, I think that your research will play an important role in bringing our world safely into the future with enough energy and your micro Uranus reactors could be the answer or a model for an answer moving forward using nuclear energy safely um, for many countries and also dealing with the waste question very, very effectively. Thank you um, so much, Professor Huang, for coming on our show and sharing these very, very important thoughts um, with our audience. It was a great pleasure having you here and um, listening to all these important issues um, from such a great expert as yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for offering me this opportunity. It's very honorable for uh, uh, communicating with uh, uh, all uh, public and European community about this idea, especially uh, when European community is leading the whole world uh, already by uh, uh, conceiving this idea uh, many decades ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>